Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to discuss all the different types of EQ we have available to us in music production and mixing to give you guys a better sense of not only all the different types of EQ, but also their different use cases in the mix. Now, a while back, I did film a dedicated module for this in one of my courses, the Mixing with Series Crash Course. So rather than re-record all of this for YouTube, I figured I would just throw to that module in the course give you kind of a free sample and a dedicated look into the different types of EQ. Now in this course, I did separate this into two separate modules. So it's going to be a bit of a long video here. I hope that you enjoy it. I've added timestamps for each of the EQ types if you're more interested in learning about any particular one of these EQs. And if you'd like to sit through the entire video, by all means, I would greatly appreciate that. I think that you'll learn a lot about the intricacies of EQ. If you'd like to check out the Mixing with Series Crash Course for yourself, it will be be the second link in the description box down below right after the free mixing guidebook I have available for you. Without further ado, let's hop into that lesson. Welcome to lesson 4.4 on EQ types. Now there are plenty of different EQ types. We are going to go through each of them in this lesson and we're going to go through each of them rather quickly to get through this in an efficient manner. But I just want to show you all of the different options we have when it comes to EQ in our music production and our mixes. So you see here, we will be working primarily on the drum subgroup right here. You can see that I have two of these Bertum EQ curve analyzer plugins right here that we can find in audio units. This is a third party plugin under Bertum EQ curve analyzer. And what these do is we have one that acts sort of as a signal generator, and then we can put plugins in between these and the latter of the plugins will show us the resulting EQ curve along with the resulting phase shift that the EQ or other plugin is applying to the signal passing through it. So I'm going to actually close this instance because we don't need to look at that one and we just want to look at the resulting phase shift and frequency graph of the EQs that we are using. Now in EQs like the FabFilter Pro Q3, which we saw earlier, we have a nice GUI or graphic user interface that is going to show us the curve. So for example, if we turn this into say a straight tilt or flat tilt and we move this, we see that we get a resulting graph in the Bertum EQ analyzer that shows us exactly what we are doing in here. But in other plugins, we will not have this graphic user interface that is going to show us exactly what the curve looks like. So we are going to rely on the EQ curve analyzer to do that for us. And additionally, we have this purple line right here, which represents the phase shift. So for example, if I quickly switch to say a bell curve, we see that we not only have the bell curve at say 500 Hertz right here. We can see in the EQ curve that we have about 11 or 12 dB here at 500 Hertz, but we also have a phase shift, which is denoted by these numbers over here. So at the center frequency, we are crossing through a zero phase. And then before the frequency, we hit a maximum phase shift of just over 30 at about 300 Hertz and then a maximum minimum at about 800 Hertz at say negative 40 degrees. So we're gonna have a lot of fun in this lesson having a look at a bunch of different EQ plugins to have a look at the different EQ types available to us. I will be referencing with the Pro Q3 quite a bit because this is such a powerful EQ plugin that has a bunch of different EQ types available within a single plugin, but we will also be looking at plugins that only have a single type of EQ available so that we can get a better idea of the options available to us and the different types of EQ. So one more thing to mention is that when I have the EQ curve analyzer on, we will not have any audio actually passed through this subgroup right here. And if I bypass it, then we will have audio passing through. So for example, if I was to play the drums back, So that is one thing to keep in mind as we move our way through this EQ types lesson. So with that, let us mute the FabFilter Pro Q3 and we will start with shelving EQ. And the first shelving EQ plugin I want to look at is by Plugin Alliance. It is the Dangerous Bax or Baxendall 
EQ. I will use the mix version for this purpose. And here we see a pretty simple graphic user interface. We have our low frequency right here for the low shelf. And we have our high frequency right here for the high shelf. We also have a high pass filter, which we can use right here. And we see that it is giving us a high pass filter in the resulting EQ curve right here. And it's also driving the phase shift upward as we cut frequencies from the signal right here. But other than the high pass, we have what is known as a shelving filter right here with a low shelf and a high shelf. So on the low shelf, we have our frequency, our corner frequency that we can choose from. We have 74 hertz, 84 hertz, 98, 116, 131, 166, 230, and 361. And we also have our gain control right here. So you notice that as I moved this low frequency cutoff point, we actually didn't get anything in the resulting EQ curve. However, if I was to increase the gain right there, you would see that we have a shelving filter coming about with a little bit of phase shift right here to the negative around the center frequency right here. And you'll notice too that on this Baxendall curve, it is a very gentle slope with a long transition band. This is characteristic of Baxendall EQs. They are very gentle rather than being steep and causing a lot of phase shift. They are rather, again, gentle and are cherished for this reason. So let's say we wanted a low shelf cut, then I could bring this down to all the way to negative five. And we see that even though we are getting negative five right here, we're actually in reality getting closer to negative six all the way down at the ending around 20 hertz right here. And we can move the shelf frequency. As we move it up, we see that the EQ curve is being pushed up and up in the frequency response, which spans from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz right here. And the same thing goes for the high shelf right here. If I reset the low shelf, let's move this frequency right here. We see that it doesn't do anything to the curve. However, if we were to boost the frequencies, say to positive five for a high shelf boost, and we can bring this down and see the resulting EQ curve right here. We can also bring this back to get a high shelf cut and adjust the frequencies as well from here. Additionally, like we had the high pass filter right here, we also have a low cut filter, which we can adjust as we see fit in the signal right here. And on top of that, we have our output control, which we can apply gain or take away gain to the entire signal right there so that we can level match the output of this plugin to match the input signal level that goes into it. So we can have a quick listen to this. Unfortunately, I will have to bypass the EQ curve so that we won't be able to see exactly what's going on. Rather, we can hear it as the drums are played. There's some high shelf boost. A, B, test it. There's it off. That's it on. Bring up the low end a little bit. So that's a great example of a shelving filter. Now, as I said, let's compare this to the Pro-Q3, which we can also create shelving filters with, as I explained in the previous lesson. We can have a low shelf where we can add gain or take away gain, and you see that we are getting similar results in this EQ analyzer right here. We can also turn this into a high shelf and get a high shelf cut or a high shelf boost right here. So we can get this in a dedicated plugin right here, like the Dangerous Backs EQ, or we can get it in the Pro Q3 or other parametric style EQs like this, which we will get into deeper in the future. Now, one thing I should mention right here is that while the Baxendall had that gentle transition band as a default with this parametric EQ, we can actually increase the slope right here or increase the Q 
so that we can make this transition band much narrower and much more aggressive, whereas we could not do that in the dangerous Bax EQ right here. So that's just something to note as we move forward in our understanding of the different EQ types. So let's close down this one. Let's bypass the Pro Q3 and move on to Tilt EQ. Now the first Tilt EQ I wanna look at is another one by Plugin Alliance. It is the Alicia Nevo filter. And right here we have an EQ gain. We can see that there is significant phase shift happening just by having this plugin on. And you'll notice that there are swift variations right here. But what this means is that we are going all the way to negative 180. And then it's as if we are continuing on. But rather than continuing into the negatives right here, we basically flip to positive 180 and continue moving downwards. So this can be thought of as a curve that continues to go down and down and down and down, even though graphically on this analyzer, it is shown as a vertical line swapping from negative 80 to positive 180 because these are effectively the same points. But that's just an interesting thing to point out in this filter right here. So with the Alicia Nevo filter, tilt filter, we have EQ gain control, EQ frequency control, filter on and off. So we can turn the filter on and off and we can also adjust the frequency by a magnitude of 10 if we wanted to. So when the EQ gain is turned clockwise, we see that we get a tilt that favors the high end energy versus the low end energy and we can get a separation much more than 6 dB here. However, we see that this positive gain maxes out around 6 dB right here. If we turn it counterclockwise, we see the opposite effect where it effectively turns into a low pass filter at the extremes, but we only get that 6 dB of boost in the low end when this is pushed to the extreme. So in this plugin, this is the curve that we get. We can also adjust our EQ frequency right here. So we can bring it down or bring it up and we can adjust the frequency by a magnitude of 10 if we'd like so that we can fine tune the center frequency of the tilt filter that much more. So let's play around with this and have a listen to what it sounds like on the drums. I'll bypass the EQ curve analyzer quickly. So a lot of low end there. That's neutral. Let's bring up the top end now. So that is one example of a tilt filter. Let's turn the EQ analyzer back on. And if we go back to the Pro-Q3 and have a look at the way this filter does tilt filters, we have a tilt shelf, which is more similar to what we had in the Nevo filter right here. You can see here that it's strange, but even though the Alicia filter is turned off, we are still getting this phase stuff going on right here in the EQ analyzer. So I'll actually just get rid of this plugin altogether. And now what we can see here is this tilt shelf is a little bit more symmetrical. It's a little bit more quote unquote perfect than the Alicia filter. This is a digital plugin using DSP to get a really perfect and precise curve in the EQ curve, whereas the Alicia Nevo filter is modeled after analog equipment, which has some impurities that often sound musical, which is why we like using those plugins. But sometimes it's great to have a nice digital plugin like the Pro-Q3 right here. So you can see that the resulting curve right here very much matches what's going on in the Pro-Q3, what it's telling us, whereas it's a little bit more all over the place in plugins like the Nevo filter by Alicia. One more I would like to show you in terms of tilt filtering is the Mixland Tilt. Let's find this one right here. This is another very simple plugin and it has our low end frequency. It has our high end frequency and we can link our low end highs right here. So you can see that just by adding this plugin on, we're getting a little bit of gain and we're getting a little bit of frequency variation right there. So it, there's a little bit of a cut around 2,500 
It's a little bit of a boost here around 300. So it's not a perfectly flat line and it's actually giving us a little bit of gain right here. But if we boost the lows, we see that we are getting that sort of shelving tilt style of EQ right here. And if we bring this back, we see that it goes the other way. So we're still getting the phase shift that we would expect from a shelving tilt style filter, but we are getting it in a different plugin right here. And this is a very simple plugin with low and high controls. We can adjust the low cutoff frequency right here. You can see how that affects the shelf. We can do the same up here for the high shelf. And if we bring that up, we see that we have a almost flat line right here in the mids before getting to kind of two shelving filters right here, like so. We can also unlink the low and the high to get more of a true shelving filter right here. So I labeled this one as a tilt EQ. It is labeled tilt after all. However, it acts more so as a sort of shelving filter when all is said and done. And you can see that in the resulting EQ curve analyzer right here. So the tilting and shelving EQs are great for individual tracks that need to be brightened or darkened in the mix. And it's great for just subtle moves to add brightness or take away brightness or add darkness or take away darkness, whichever way you'd like to look at it in your mix. They are typically very simple plugins to use with very few controls. So they're easy to really dial in quickly and continue on in the mix. They won't give us all of the control of say a fully parametric EQ like the Pro Q3, but for very quick adjustments to the overall balance of the high end versus the low end, I really like these plugins in mixing and music production. So moving on, let's have a look at graphic EQ. We've done this already in this course, but let's bring up instead of the Waves GEQ that we saw last time, let's have a look at the Waves API 560. And here you can see that we have quite a bit of phase shift happening in the signal. We also see that there is some dancing going on right here. That is a side effect of the EQ analyzer right there. So I hope that this isn't too distracting. But here we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 bands spanning from 31 hertz all the way up to 16 kilohertz. And these are basically in octaves from each other. So 31 to 63 to 125 to 250 to 500 to 1K, 2K, 4K, 8K and 16K. We can see that we can turn the EQ on and off by hitting the in button. That means that the EQ is now on and turning it off turns the EQ off. We have our polarity flip right here, which can flip the polarity of the signal. And we can turn on this analog modeling, which adds a little bit of noise to the signal. All of these plugins are obviously digital EQs. However, many of them are emulating analog circuitry or analog sounding EQ. So like we had in the GEQ from Waves, we have these individual faders. These ones are laid out horizontally rather than vertically. But what we can do is turn them up to the right would be adding. And we see the resulting EQ curve there. Or we can cut and we see the resulting EQ curve there. So this is centered at 8K and we see right here that sure enough, these are centered right at about 8K, maybe a little bit higher. We can adjust the 1K, for example, up or down. And let's have a listen to how this sounds on the drums. Again, I'm going to have to turn this off. Sixty-three can help bring the kick drum up. Let's A B test. Maybe we'll bring down some of that low, low end. But 
but that's another example of a graphic EQ right here. Now, I won't show you that on the Pro Q3 because the Pro Q3 does not have the capability of a graphic EQ. But again, the graphic EQ is super simple. It gives us individual faders and we can really see what we're doing on the graph without actually having a graph like the EQ curve right here, because it is graphical in the sense that we can see I can decrease the gain at 31, increase it at 63, and so on and so forth. So I get a sort of idea of what the frequency curve is graphically just by looking at the EQ itself. So moving on, let's have a look at parametric EQ first, and then we will have a look at semi-parametric EQ. So the parametric EQ that we've been using thus far is everybody's favorite, once again, the Pro-Q3. And a parametric EQ offers full customization of the frequency bands, including the choice of filter type, oftentimes the center frequency or corner frequency, the Q factor or quality factor, and the relative gain, the boost or the cut. So a parametric EQ gives us a sort of continuous control over all of the important parameters. It's considered to be one of the more powerful EQ styles that we have. And the parameters that we have available to us often differ depending on the filter type, which in the case of the Pro-Q3 is individually accessible per band. The number of bands in a parametric EQ is typically between three and seven, although other plugins like the Pro-Q3 offer many more. So I can continuously double click here to create new bands and just continue to create bands on and on, even though I likely wouldn't need this many bands. Let's just undo all of those. The common parameters of parametric EQ include the center frequency of the mid style bands. And so the center frequency of say a bell type which depends on the center frequency, or in this case, we have our notch, which has a center frequency, or the bandpass, which has a center frequency here. Even the tilt filters have a center frequency, or we could have a corner frequency, which is common in the low cut and high cut filters right here, as well as with the shelving filters right here. So if I have a high shelf, we'll see that we have a corner or cutoff frequency rather than a center frequency, technically speaking. The other obvious parameter we have here is gain, where we can either boost or cut, especially in these shelving filters and in the bell filters and other filters that pass frequencies like the band pass, notch, and the high pass and low pass. We don't really have too much control over the gain of the signal. In fact, this gain is grayed out for this. However, for many other filters, as I mentioned, we do have control over the amount of gain that is applied or taken away from the signal. So additive EQ is when we add gain and subtractive EQ is when we subtract gain from the signal. We also have slope controls. In this case, we currently have a 12 dB per octave slope, although we can go all the way up to brick wall in the case of these high pass filters. You can see that the phase over here kind of goes haywire because this is an extreme filter right here. However, we can also go much gentler if we'd like all the way down to a 6 dB. And you see here that the phase shift that results from a gentler slope is much more gentle itself. We also have in the Pro-Q3 control over the slope of many other filter types. Now, this is not typical in other parametric EQs, but the Pro-Q3 is just so powerful and it has so much flexibility in the plugin itself. You can see here that while there is significant phase shift happening right here, this craziness over here happens when the actual EQ curve is practically at negative infinity. So we aren't really going to hear any of this phase shift because there's not going to be any audio signal left. It's going to be completely filtered out at that point. And of course, we have our filter selection oftentimes with the ability to choose between our various filter types, as we mentioned in a previous lesson. Another big benefit about parametric EQ is the ability to sweep the frequencies of our filters. So for example, we have a bell cut right here and I can sweep this around to my heart's content to whatever frequency I want it to be at, whether I'm boosting or cutting. We can also freely adjust the Q to make things narrower or wider and overall just tons of control 
over the overall sound of the audio passing through these parametric EQs. So I'll play back the drums just a little bit. I've already done this, but I will just move around some of these different filters to get a better sense of how we can use a fully parametric EQ like the Pro-Q3. I can also analyze right here. Sometimes it's not good to mix with your eyes when you have the analyzer set up, but in this case, I want to see what's going on in case of the drums right here. So you see the kick is right here. What happens if we boost those frequencies? We get more kick. We get more snare right here. little bit of a ringing frequency I might want to bring that one down let's add in another band here maybe I'll turn this into a high shelf let's add a little bit more crispiness to the top end and I'll add a little boost right here to the kick as well as the snare let's narrow this AB. Let's roll off a little bit down here as well. So that's the power of a fully parametric EQ. I could just easily go in and boost and cut whatever I want specifically in the audio that I am affecting. Let's turn this EQ back on. I will turn off the analyzer because it kind of goes a little crazy there and is it distracting when it's analyzing itself. And you can see here that the frequency curve right here pretty much matches what we have going on here. And the resulting phase curve can be seen here in purple. But of course the Pro-Q3 is not the only parametric EQ that we have available to us. We also have many more including Logic's own channel EQ. I love this plugin. I use it all the time in my mixes. And right here, instead of inserting all of the bands ourselves, we have a predefined number of bands. So we have a high pass filter right here, a low pass filter right here. We have two shelves, a low and a high. And then we have four fully parametric bands of EQ right here. So much like the Pro-Q3, we can freely drag these around to either do additive or subtractive EQ with these bell bands. We can adjust the shelves, the low shelf, high or low. Same thing up here with the high shelf. And we can adjust the cue to make things more narrow or wider as we see fit. So here is another great example of an EQ. We also have our analyzing post or pre EQ. We can couple this. We can process just the stereo, the left only, the right only, the mids only, the sides only. And we have a high quality option right here if we see fit, as well as a gain control for the master gain of what is coming out of this plugin right here, the Logic Channel EQ. So it's a little bit more simple than the Pro-Q3, but it's a great option in Logic. And if you do happen to be a Logic user, you can also see right here that if I get rid of this instance of the Channel EQ, so that this one becomes the first one in the insert chain right here, you can see that the curve actually shows up right here nicely at the top of the channel right here, which is a nice feature that I like in Logic. So if I were to adjust this, you can see that the curve right here has changed in the actual channel of the drum subgroup. So let's quickly return actually to the Pro-Q3 because each of these filters themselves can be changed so that they act either on the stereo, the left, the right, the mid, or the side information of the audio. So this is a super powerful plugin where the channel EQ, we could do that globally. In the Pro-Q3, we can do that on a per band basis, which is super powerful when it comes time to really honing in on the mix. Now for basic moves, I may not reach for the Pro-Q right away, but for very specific stuff that I need done with EQ, this is one of my go-to plugins and has been for a while now.
but not all parametric EQs are laid out digitally like this. We also have many other styles of analog type parametric EQs. Let's have a look, for example, at one of my favorite plugins, the Waves SSL E channel strip. So where is it right here? And this one is a little bit different. Let's actually turn this off for a second so that we don't get this distracting bouncing of the levels right here. But we see that we have an interesting setup right here where we have EQ and filters on this side and dynamics on this side. This is a channel strip, but I wanted to focus in specifically on the parametric bands within this EQ. So we have our high pass right here, which we can adjust the corner frequency of all the way up to 350 hertz. So we can't bring this all the way up like in many other fully digital parametric EQs, but we do have a lot of control over where that corner frequency is, and we likely wouldn't want to bring it above that frequency anyway. And then we have our low pass up here, which we can bring out and then all the way down to 3000 hertz right here. We have the option of doing a high shelf or a bell type EQ right here, which we have control over the gain and the frequency right here, whether we choose a center frequency with a bell type or a corner frequency with a shelf type. Skipping these two EQs, we have a low shelf or low bell, which we can adjust the gain of between negative 15 and positive 15, as well as the frequency, whether it's the center and the bell or a corner and a shelf from 30 all the way to 450. So these bands right here are what I would consider semi-parametric because they don't have all of the controls, notably the Q control, and we will get to semi-parametric EQ shortly. However, I wanted to focus on these two right here, the low mid frequency and the high mid frequency bands of the SSL E channel strip, because these ones are considered fully parametric because we have control over the decibel amount, the amount of gain, all the way from negative 15 to positive 15. We have also control over the center frequency right here from 600 hertz to 7,000 hertz. And we have control over the Q factor to make things narrower when it's all the way to the left or wider when it's all the way to the right. So these are the three controls that we need to have something technically classified as a parametric EQ. So this band itself, along with this band, which has similar controls, is a parametric band in this EQ or this channel strip. So I just wanted to put that out there as well, that it's not only the fully parametric digital plugins that offer an immense amount of control that are considered to be parametric EQ. These analog versions are also considered to be parametric EQ. Now, these two, of course, are semi-parametric. There's no Q control, but these two bands right here can be considered parametric. So just in terms of terminology, I wanted to point this one out and we can quickly have a listen to these two bands right here and what they can do for us in the drums right here. So let's bring out these high pass, low pass filters and I'll set everything to zero and move on from there. So there I'm boosting at seven. Narrow this down. Maybe I want to cut there a little bit and then widen that out. What about the low mids? Maybe I want to cut a little bit of that mud right there. And maybe I'll make that a little bit wider. A B test. So not a world of difference, but it just helps to clean up the mid range and the sort of boxiness or muddiness if those terms mean anything to you. But mainly I just wanted to focus in on these two bands right here as being parametric, even though this is not technically a fully parametric EQ, it does have two fully parametric bands. So speaking of which, let's move on to semi-parametric EQ. And as we can likely guess, semi-parametric EQ, which is sometimes referred to as quasi-parametric EQ, offers some but not all of the customizations of a parametric EQ. So the customization of the frequency bands 
could include the choice of filter type, center frequency, Q factor value, and the relative gain. However, it will be missing one of those. So semi-parametric EQs are essentially parametric EQs, only with a few options missing. Most often, this missing functionality is the lack of a Q control, as we can see here, coming back to the SSL channel right here. The low frequency and high frequency options do afford us control over the filter type, whether we want a bell or a shelf. It offers us control over the gain. It offers us control over the frequency, whether that's the corner or the center frequency. However, it doesn't offer us control over the Q. And so we can consider these bands as being semi-parametric rather than fully parametric. We also have EQ options that are completely semi-parametric. One option right here in plugin form could be the Sound Toys PsiQ right here, or PsiEQ. Let's open this one up and we'll see if the EQ curve will play nicely. There we go. Quite a bit of phase shift there, but we will deal with it. And what we have here are a few different bands. We have our lows, our mids, and our highs. And with the low, we have control over the positive gain or the negative gain. And we can see here that this is a shelving filter with a fixed corner frequency. And we have the same thing up here with the high. It is a shelf by default. We cannot change that fact. And it has a predefined corner frequency that we cannot change either. However, in the mids, we do have control over the center frequency. So we do have a bit of parametric control. Let's bring these back to zero so that we can really see what the mids are doing. And so we can boost all the way up to eight and we can move the center frequency of this mid band up and down as so, as well as actually cutting in that band. So we can see what this is doing in the EQ curve analyzer by Bertum. But because we don't have full control over everything in terms of the mids, lows, and highs, we will classify this Psi EQ as a semi-parametric option. Another one we can look at is the Waves API 550B. Let's bring this one up. And right here, we see that we have a little bit of movement right here. So I hope that's not too distracting. But we have four bands right here and this outer knob, we have control over the gain. So we can go all the way up to 12 and all the way down to negative 12. And then right here in the inner knob, we have control over the frequency. So we can go 2.5K, 5K, 7K, 10K. This is the high shelf. So let's maybe give a little boost right here. Then we have two bands right here, the high mid frequencies. Let's bring this say to 8K and we'll give a boost of, I don't know, 4 dB. Let's cut a little bit from the low mids, for example. We will bring this to say 180 to try to bring up some of that snare, for example. And then let's cut a little bit of the low end right here, which is a shelf. So let's bring this up to say 50 and then we'll bring down the level right here. So in this case, we have control over the gain and the frequency, whether that's a corner frequency in the case of these shelves or the center frequency in the case of these bell filters. However, we have no control over the Q. I will mention here that we do have control over whether the high frequency and low frequency are shelves or bell filters. So we do have that option. But again, because there is no Q control in this, we cannot classify it as a fully parametric EQ. All right, moving on, we have our linear phase EQs. Now, a linear phase EQ is a type of equalization that does not alter the phase relationship of the source. And that's why I wanted to bring out this EQ curve analyzer and show you how much EQs alter the phase of the signals passing through them. Because when we get to linear phase, the whole point is to not have any phase shift whatsoever. So achieving linear phase is not possible with analog circuits. Rather, it has been made possible with DSP or digital signal processing. Many analog and digital equalizers are considered minimum phase EQs since manufacturers typically design them to have as little phase shift as possible. However, any reactive components often capacitors, but sometimes inductors and analog EQs will shift the phase of some frequencies in the output relative to the input. 
this phase shift will affect the sound. In some cases, the phase shift produces sonically pleasing effects, and in many other cases, it doesn't. So we did discuss in earlier modules the importance of phase relationships, particularly in drums and other percussive or transient rich signals. And so we don't want to go too far with our EQs and mess about with the phase relationships that much in the mix if we don't have to. And you saw in the previous EQ examples that I was showing you that the EQs themselves, even this Pro-Q3, which has a very detailed map or EQ curve right here, these EQs don't show us the phase shift that's actually happening behind the scenes. So again, why I wanted to show you the resulting curves in the Bertum EQ curve analyzer here. But with linear phase EQ, what you see is what you get. There's no behind the scenes phase shifting going on. Linear phase EQs analyze the frequency content of a signal and apply gain to the appropriate frequencies via finite impulse response filters to eliminate any phase shifting that arises. This process is rather CPU intensive, which is why it's only possible in advanced plugins, and it will actually cause a delay in the output signal through latency because it is so CPU intensive. To make up for this latency, linear phase EQs often shift the output signal earlier in time which will cause a sort of pre-ringing where an echo will precede the intended output. This pre-ringing is often imperceptible, thankfully, though it may become audible with steeper filters, particularly if the signal has strong transients. So with linear phase EQ, we're effectively trading phase shift for pre-ringing artifacts. Now, in most cases, if we're only boosting a few dB like we are right here, these phase shifts and pre-ringing will not be audible whether we choose a non-linear phase or a linear phase EQ. However, it's still important to know that these things are going on when you get into using EQ. So linear phase EQs are excellent tools, especially when we are doing parallel processing like harmonic excitement, for example, where we are saturating a parallel signal and then high passing that signal so that we only saturate the high end because it, again, doesn't introduce any phase shift. So there won't be any unnatural sort of phase cancellation going on when the dry and the process tracks are mixed together again. It's also useful for getting more involved EQ curves. Say, for example, if we wanted a lot more bands in this EQ right here, because again, it won't alter the phase of the signal where typically having a lot of peaks and valleys like this would cause significant phase shift in the signal. For example, if we turn this on, we can see that there is subtle, but a lot of phase movement throughout the frequency spectrum right here. And we've been using the Pro-Q3 for many of our demos right here. So let's continue on using this super powerful EQ plugin. And right down here, we can choose between zero latency, natural phase, and linear phase options right here. So the Pro-Q3 actually is a linear phase EQ if we choose it to be. And so if we click on linear phase right here, we can see in the Bertum EQ analyzer that we have no phase shift right here whatsoever, even though we are still maintaining this EQ curve that we have going on. And I can adjust this without any change to the overall phase shift of this plugin. So linear phase is super powerful for that reason. And if we listen to the drums now, we can hear that it's not sounding any different from the natural phase by itself. So it's pretty neat. We can get away with a lot of intricate EQ moves without incurring a lot of phase shift or any phase shift for that matter in the actual signal itself. Before we move on, I want to show you an instance where we get pre-ringing. And so what I'm going to do is get rid of a lot of these bands and just focus on a single band, particularly in the low end. I'll go around the kick where the frequencies are much lower and therefore a little bit more susceptible to the pre-ringing effect. And what I'm going to do is boost the gain around the fundamental of the kick drum, which is about 60 hertz. And we are going to listen for pre-ringing that comes about as a result of ensuring that there is no phase shift. So let's have a listen here. It has to get pretty extreme before we start actually perceiving the pre-ringing, but I just wanted to show you what that's all about here.
So you hear that whoom, whoom, whoom. that is pre ringing happening on that kick drum right here, but it's only happening when we are going about 29 dB of gain right there. So this is completely unnatural. I don't think anybody would do this in an actual mix, but I just wanted to show you what pre ringing actually is because I found a lot of information that pre ringing actually happens, but not a whole lot of examples actually showing pre ringing so that we can actually hear it in our EQs. So that is linear phase EQ. Now let's close down this EQ so that we can get our latency back to normal. All right, so I can hear myself all right now. And what I want to do at this point is talk about passive EQ. So a passive EQ, as the name would suggest, uses passive filters to sculpt the frequency content of audio signals. So these are analog devices. We aren't obviously going to look at analog devices in this training. However, we will have a look at a few plugins that emulate passive equalization. And in order to get gain out of these passive EQs, there's actually an amplification stage after the filtering stage. So the filters themselves can only cut or apply subtractive EQ. However, we do have a gain stage typically at the end of the analog passive equalizer to give us boost or at least to provide makeup gain after the fact. So because these EQs don't use op amps or transistors within the actual EQ portion of their circuits, they often offer simpler design and much less distortion overall. They can be designed often with inductors rather than the typical capacitors, which do offer some coloration to the sound, though this coloration is generally perceived as being pleasant. So passive filter circuits attenuate the signal and thereby worsen the signal to noise ratio. So even with their drawbacks, passive EQs are often highly sought after in the analog world for their character and the way that they make these signals sound. So the two most popular passive EQs are likely the Poltec EQ P1A and MEQ5. There are plenty of plugins on the market that aim to emulate these classics. But today, let's just have a look at the Waves Puig Tech options right here. We will open up the Puig Tech EQ P1A first. Let's go with the stereo option. These are modeled after Jack Joseph Puig's models the legendary mixer, and I think that they sound pretty damn good. So let's open up this EQ curve analyzer right here. We see that there's a lot of phase stuff going on, but what we are more concerned with right here is how this interface works. It can be a little intimidating if you're just getting used to it, but essentially we have these three controls for the low end, these three controls for the top end or upper mids, and then this control for the high end cut. So starting with the high end cut, we can choose between 5K, 10K or 20K, and we can choose the amount of attenuation we want in the signal. So by driving this up, you see that the EQ curve is going down. We can adjust that to 10 or five to get a varying amount of this low end shelf type filter right here. And then if we move on to this part, we have an adjustable center frequency in this case between three kilohertz and 16 kilohertz with steps in between. We can also adjust the bandwidth right here. So this is a boost. So effectively what we are doing is in the actual unit, we aren't able to boost anything because we are using passive components. So we are relying on the amplification stage at the end of the signal chain within the unit itself to apply this boost right here. So let's start with about five dB of boost right here. We can adjust the center frequency right here. And you'll notice that depending on what center frequency we choose, we get a different bandwidth right here just by default. And that is just modeled after the analog circuitry of this. So these imperfections are part of the sonic character of these units and partly the reason why these plugins have become so popular. We can also adjust the bandwidth right here. And you see that as we increase the bandwidth to make the boost wider, we are losing a little bit of that boost overall. So right here, we are trying to boost about 5 dB. However, starting at 1 dB, we're getting really only about two and a half. However, if we sharpen this up, we see that as the boost gets a bit narrower, we actually get back quite a bit of that boost right here. So in this case, we are getting that 5 dB boost. However, we have a sort of baseline at 1 dB. So ultimately, we're getting a boost of about four. Now on the low end is where things get a bit more interesting. Here on the boost, we have a low shelf boost right here that we can control. 
And right here, I'm bringing it up at about 100 hertz, but we can drop that down to 60 hertz, 30, or even 20. And you see that even at 20, we're actually getting quite significant gain even at 100 right here, even though the maximum sort of levels out at about 20 right here. So this CPS is really where the gain is going to level out versus where the gain is going to start at. And then we also have an attenuation knob in the low end, which actually attenuates a little bit above the boost right here. So this is also a shelving type filter, but the way it interacts with the boost makes it look more like a bell than a shelf filter right here. So I can bring this attenuation all the way up and we see that we have a sort of drop in the mid range. However, if I was to bring this boost down, we would see that the filter is actually much more of a shelving type filter that turns into a high pass. So if we bring this up like that, we can see that certainly this is more of a shelving filter. So super interesting plugin, and I think it's fascinating to actually have a look at the frequency graph that is produced by the varying options that we have right here. It may be far from what you would expect, and it's important to get a grasp on how these different analog emulations actually affect the signal by actually having a look at the EQ curves that are produced by them. So in addition to the EQ P1A, we also have the MEQ5. Let's have a look at this one as well. I will go the stereo option once again. So now in this plugin, we have this section for the low mid peak. We have this section for the mid frequency dip. And then we have this section for the mid or high peak. We also have a gain control and we can introduce analog noise right here if we so choose based on 60 cycle hum or 50 cycle hum if we want to emulate more so that analog feel of this plugin. So beginning with the low mid peak, we have our frequency selection right here and we can adjust this as we see fit and move around these frequencies. And you see that we only have control over the peak right here. And much like the EQP1A, the actual bandwidth of this peak actually changes a little bit as we shift from center frequency to center frequency. So let's bring this one back down. We can move on now to the mid dip right here. And again, we have our frequency control. We can go from 200 Hertz all the way up to seven kilohertz. And we have the amount of dip that we want to introduce into the signal. We can move this around once again. You see those bandwidths changing depending on the center frequency that we choose. And we also have our high mid peak right here where we can adjust the amount and the frequency right here. Let's bring this down so we can really see that in action like so. And before we go, let's bring back that EQP1A right here and let's have a listen to these. So I will bring both of them up and we can just have a listen to what they sound like on the drums. So it adds a little bit of that subtle saturation because it's modeled after the passive components of these Pultec EQs. But just messing around a little bit, I thought that we got a little bit of a better sound out of these drums by just messing around with these filters right here. If I was to turn this back on and see what we are doing, see that there's not a great variation within the overall EQ curve of these plugins being used together but it's sometimes worth to go back and actually see what our EQ moves are actually doing. I would always suggest 
first and foremost to rely on your ears whenever it comes to EQing anything or compressing anything or mixing in general, rather than relying on the EQ curves. And that's another big reason why these plugins are so great is that they don't have any visual feedback as to what the actual curve looks like. But because I'm teaching EQ, I think it's important to actually see what's going on as we make moves in this EQ. Okay, moving on, we have Dynamic EQ, and the first plugin we will have a look at is the Tokyo Dawn Labs TDR Nova right here. So this is a pretty neat plugin, and Dynamic EQ is a type of equalization where the EQ of certain frequencies is triggered dynamically, hence the name, as those frequencies surpass a set amplitude threshold in the audio signal. So we can effectively think of dynamic EQ as a hybrid of compression and EQ. I know that we haven't gotten to compression yet. That is the topic of the next module, but I wanted to go through dynamic EQ quickly because it is a style of EQ after all. So basically dynamic EQ will only cause its bands to act as the signal surpasses a set threshold in that band. It's kind of similar to multiband compression in this way, in that it attenuates specific bands of frequencies as these frequencies surpass their set threshold. The main difference is that dynamic EQ doesn't have the predetermined frequency bands with crossover filters. Rather, each EQ filter in a dynamic EQ produces its own band. But dynamic EQs can also boost frequencies as the band exceeds the threshold, whereas a multiband compressor would require expansion to achieve the same sort of thing. Depending on the dynamic EQ, we can have a variety of different bands. For example, the TDR Nova offers the typical bell as well as shelving right here. So we have a high shelf, low shelf, and the bell type filters for up to four bands. For the training purposes here, I'm only going to focus on a single band to hone in on the actual dynamic action of dynamic EQ. So the additional parameters that we need to be aware of include the threshold, the ratio, and the attack and release times. So the threshold is the set level that when exceeded by the audio within the band will cause the EQ to engage on the selected frequency band. In dynamic EQs, these will be set on a filter by filter basis. So for example, if we turned on number three right here, filter number three, we see that we don't have dynamic EQ engaged. However, we can engage it and adjust the threshold as we see fit. The attack time is a control that adjusts the time it takes for the EQ to reach its full boost or cut once the threshold is surpassed in the specific bandwidth of the filter. And the release time is another time control that adjusts the time it takes for the boost or cut to fade back to the original EQ curve once that level within the filter bandwidth drops back down below the set threshold. The ratio control right here sets the amount of level that can surpass the threshold per dB that passes that set threshold. So for example, a ratio of 2.0 to 1 means that for every two decibels that signal passes above the set threshold here, only one decibel will actually get above that threshold. So higher ratios means that there will be more EQ applied to the signal, whereas lower ratios will mean that less EQ is applied to that signal. So we see that the threshold is kind of dancing around right here. Bertum EQ analyzer is a little bit finicky like that. So let's turn that off just for the rest of this explanation. But focusing on a single band for now, we see that we have independent control of the boost or cut that we want, and then independent control of the actual dynamic EQ right here. So let's start by listening to the drums first, and I'm going to select in right here so that we can monitor the frequencies of the signal going in. So you see in this band right here, every time the snare hits, we get peaks right here. We see that a little bit of the peak is surpassing this threshold line right here. We adjust the threshold. We see that more and more of that signal is surpassing the threshold, which is causing this EQ to pull down in this band. If we increase the ratio, we'll see that we get more cutting for every time the signal surpasses that threshold. And if we bring the ratio down, we see that we can actually get a instance where we are adding boost to the signal rather than cutting it once we get down past a one-to-one -one ratio. So at ratios less than one-to-one, -one, we are actually boosting the signal. Ratios of 
above one to zero, we're going to be cutting the signal. We can adjust the Q. We can adjust the frequency. And then we can also adjust the actual gain of the filter itself. Another cool thing about the TDR Nova is that it's actually a parallel EQ processor. So we have this dry mix right here where we can introduce more of the unaffected signal into the mix and blend it in with the EQ'd version of the signal here if we so wanted to. And if we looked at the EQ curve analyzer right here, we would see that we have the EQ curve that we would expect. And I would show you what happens to the phase as this happens to duck and come back up. However, I cannot play audio while this EQ curve analyzer is on. And so unfortunately, I can't show you that in real time as much as I would like to. Instead, we will return to the old faithful. Let's turn off the TDR Nova and go to our Pro-Q3. And the Pro-Q3 being the powerful plugin that it is, actually affords us the option to make individual bands dynamic as well, just like the TDR Nova. So we can make a band dynamic. And then we have our band dynamic range right here, which basically controls whether we want to boost it or cut it. It's a slightly different way of going about things rather than relying on a ratio like we did in the TDR. So the TDR is set up more so like a compressor using ratio threshold and the like. Whereas in the Pro-Q3, we have a dynamic range right here. So we can adjust this so that it boosts dynamically or cuts dynamically. And we also, again, have control over the static rather than the dynamic part of that band right here. So let's have a listen. I'll move some parameters around and we can have a listen right here. There's also this auto control right here where we can set the threshold to our liking or have it set again to auto. So I'll move around this threshold. I'll move around the dynamic range right here and we can have a listen to what that sounds like. The threshold will give us more boost. So we're never going to go above this maximum boost right here of 7.72 dB. But by turning down the threshold, we can regularly max that out. And in addition to controlling it with these controls down here, I can also just drag this around as I did with the other bands previously. So I hope that makes a lot of sense and that you see the power of using dynamic EQ right here. We can use dynamic EQ to help increase or decrease the specific frequencies that we want to dynamically within the mix which makes it useful for things like de for making certain notes either pop or come back, especially if there are resonant ringing frequencies in certain instruments. And it's just overall an important tone shaping tool in EQ that we can use dynamically throughout the entirety of the mix. I rely heavily on dynamic EQ if there are resonant frequencies that aren't always apparent. Say if I got sent or recorded myself a instrument that has a specific frequency that is really resonant but only shows up in certain parts of the song, then I would typically reach for a dynamic EQ and have a dynamic cut happen whenever that resonance gets a little bit too nasty, which would allow the dynamic EQ to clamp down just on that frequency as it arises in the mix. So we've still got a few to go. I hope you're sticking around with me. And the next one I have to show you is a freeform EQ. And I'm going to start off with the Photo Sounder. Where is it? Spline EQ. So this EQ introduces a ton of latency. I just turned off my headphones so that I can't hear myself for that reason. And what it uses is finite impulse responses, which introduce a lot of latency, as well as Bezier splines. So there is significant pre-ringing and post-ringing when we get to rather significant cuts or boosts. 
However, what I want to show you with this EQ is that we can literally just go in and draw whatever we want in this EQ without worrying about individual bands with individual Q controls and gain controls and what have you. We can just go in and draw the exact EQ curve that we want. So we can get pretty wild with these different EQs. And we can have a look at what this looks like in the EQ curve analyzer. See that we are giving pretty intense EQ right here. So maybe let's back that off a little bit. So maybe let's have a listen to what this sounds like in the mix. So it's a pretty cool concept. I don't personally use these freeform style EQs that much or at all really in my mixes. I prefer to rely on the more standard EQs, but this is a pretty neat option for us to consider when thinking about getting new EQs. So once again, this is the Photo Sounder Spline EQ, which uses finite impulse responses and Bezier splines to allow us the free form draw as you wish type of EQ. But I also wanted to show you another style right here from Milda Production, which is labeled M Freeform Equalizer, which is a very suitable name. And this one also introduces a ton of latency. So I have my headphones turned off once again, but this one uses fast Fourier transforms or FFTs in order to give us the draw as you go style of equalization right here. So much like the photo sounder option, we can go in and draw exactly what we want without a care in the world. And then we can have a look at what this looks like in the EQ curve analyzer. And you can see that because we are using the fast Fourier transforms, we have absolutely linear phase right here. However, we have the drawback with the fast Fourier transforms of having very poor base resolution as the fast Fourier transform tries to approximate frequencies in this range where the octaves are very close together in terms of the frequency number in Hertz. And actually, now that I think about it, the photo sounder EQ is also a linear phase. I don't know why this EQ curve analyzer was freaking out, but perhaps it was not identifying correctly the phase of the photo sounder spline EQ. Either way, the phase right here is linear and we can again go in and draw the exact EQ curve that we see fit. Or we can hold down the pencil tool right here and draw things exactly how we want them in the mix. So a cool technology, again, I don't use it personally myself, but it's necessary for me to show you in this training so that you have that option for yourself in your own mixes. All right, let's exit out of these and I will turn my headphones back on, hopefully. Check, check. I can hear myself without latency now, so that's good. And the next option we have for EQ is the auto EQ. And what I have for this personally is the isotope ozone 10 stabilizer there are a few other options notably the sound theory Golfos or the sonable smart eq those are two great options i don't have those personally so instead i'm going to show you what i have here in the isotope ozone 10 stabilizer now what we have here are a few different algorithms that we can choose from Let's go with RMB Soul, for example. This is a mastering plugin, so it's not going to do a great job on just the drums themselves. However, if I put it on the entirety of the mix, it does a pretty good job of analyzing the frequency content and giving an EQ curve that dynamically moves throughout the song to sort of emulate what it thinks an R&B and soul song should sound like in this case. Although we have, as you see here, a few different options to choose from. So actually, I'm going to bring this over to the mix bus right here. And then 
let's have a listen to the mix bus and what the ozone 10 stabilizer is going to do Personally, I think that's bringing in way too much low end, so I can bring down the percentage that is going to act on the lows right here. Maybe I'll bring that down to 20%. Let's turn up the smoothing. Now, where we haven't mixed this song yet, it's going to make suggestions that may not be perfect just yet. It works a lot better the better mix you have. After all, this is a mastering plugin. But I just wanted to show you one of the options. Again, the Gulfos by Sound Theory is a great option, as is the Smart EQ Plus by Sonable. This stabilizer plugin by Isotope is specifically made for mastering, so it may not be the best option to demo with right here, but it is an EQ that I thought would be valuable to show you in this training. So let's move on now to Match EQ. So I'll turn this off, get rid of the Ozone 10. And what I'm going to do now is bring up another Isotope plugin from the Ozone collection called the Match EQ, named appropriately. And so what I'm going to do now is record a reference track. So click Capture to record a custom target spectrum snapshot. You can save your spectrum snapshot as presets. And then I'm going to click capture to record a spectrum snapshot of my track. So what I'm going to do here now is open up my reference, make sure that I have the reference on and that the reference plugin is before the Ozone 10 match EQ right here. So I'm going to play this back and the reference track that we have is going to be played into this. We are going to capture it and then we will apply it to our actual track right here. So we are still focusing in on the mix bus at this stage. We are no longer looking just at the drums and let's have a look at how this works. Something I can't control for you, dear. Is there some way I can know how to just get out? Why do you take me in and then leave me on the ground? So Isotope 10 Match EQ just took a snapshot of what the general EQ curve is of the reference track. Now let's go back to our original so that we are feeding our mix or lack of a mix into this mix bus Ozone 10 Match EQ. We are going to capture that now.
and we will effectively apply this EQ curve in white to the mix that we are working on based on what we captured from our reference right here. So that is basically match EQ in a nutshell. We also have other options. We don't have just the isotope ozone as we may suspect from the rest of this training. We also have an option in the Pro-Q3 to get a match EQ set up. All right, and inside of Pro-Q3, we'll go down here to the analyzer and click on EQ match. And now we have a few different options here. We can either choose our reference from a reference spectrum, which I don't have any saved, from the external sidechain. So we can actually send an audio signal to the sidechain here, or we can use the input. So I will choose input right here and make sure that I am inputting the reference track rather than the mix we are currently working on. And now what I'm going to do is just play back the reference for a little bit so that Pro-Q3 can gather an idea of the frequency content of the reference. So let's do that. You'd be living in the green. Now, normally I would let it run for a little bit longer than that, but just for time's sake, we are going to keep it short. And then I'm going to switch to the original and I'm going to record the input as the original. So let's run this through. And you can see that it's generating quite a drastic EQ curve to try to match the input this mix to the reference, which we just recorded previously. And again, normally I would let that run for a little bit longer, but now we can match these and Pro-Q3 is automatically going to create a curve like this. Now what I can do is go through here and sort of smooth this out. So drag the slider to adjust the number of bands used to approximate the measured difference curve. Click finish when ready. So this is going to give us nothing. And then we can add different uh, numbers of curves right here to approximate what Pro-Q3 deems to be the difference on average between the frequency content between these two mixes. So let's just go all the way to 24 for practice sake and hit finish right here. And now we have all of these bands set up and an EQ curve that is approximating the reference mix. So let's go ahead and close reference two for now and we will AB this Pro-Q3. So at this point where I haven't done much processing yet on the mix, I'm not overly confident that this EQ curve is going to make the mix sound better, but we will go through listen and AB it. And as expected, I think it sounds quite a bit worse. It's very tinny and trill up in this high end right here. And so I wouldn't use Match EQ and I really don't use Match EQ all that much. While I do often depend on reference mixes to get the high end and the low end right in my mixes, I rarely ever reach for Match EQ. I just really wanted to show you this as one of the many options we have in EQ. And finally, here on the EQ types lesson, I want to talk briefly about mono EQ, stereo EQ, and mid-side EQ. So again, what better plugin to do this on than the Pro-Q3? Let's just go to the default settings here where we can get individual bands to affect different parts of the spectrum right here. So we can choose from left only, right only, stereo, mid, or side. So mid EQ is only going to adjust what is equal in the left and right channels of the stereo mix, whereas a side band or a band of EQ or an EQ in general that is only working on the sides information will only affect the information that is different between the left and the right channels. So mid and side may be a bit erroneous. Perhaps a better way of describing this would be sum and difference. However, you get the point. The side portion of the EQ will only affect what is different in the left and right channels and the mid EQ will only affect what is the same in those channels. This is super useful for stereo processing, particularly if we use the sides EQ right here to get rid of or at least attenuate a lot of the low end information. Oftentimes we don't want a whole lot of stereo information in the very low end. We want that very much in the center. And so sometimes adding 
a high pass filter or a low shelving cut can really help to clean up the low end even more within the mix. So in this instance, we are cutting everything from the sides below 62 and we can give a little boost somewhere in the mid range. Let's have a listen and I will adjust this as necessary. Sometimes bringing up the high end on the sides can be nice. And bringing things back to the analogy of EQ being like frequency dependent faders. When we are dealing with mid side EQ, we can think of mid side EQ more as width modulation, if that makes sense. So when we are pushing up the sides information at certain frequencies, we are effectively making the mix wider at those frequencies. And when we are cutting the sides or making the mids louder compared to the sides, we are effectively narrowing the mix in those frequencies. So that makes up the bulk of what I wanted to talk about in this case. The difference between mono and stereo EQ should be pretty obvious at this point. A mono EQ will only affect a mono signal, whereas a stereo EQ will affect a stereo signal. Now, many stereo EQs will have linking, so they will affect both the left and the right channels the same. However, we can also have instances like in the Pro-Q3 where we can choose to affect only one side and not the other. So for instance, we can have this band only affect the left channel and we can have another band right here only affect the right channel. So with this right here, we would hear a big lop side in the mix, especially down here where we are at a pretty low frequency around 134. So this is gonna sound terrible, but I just wanna show you how stereo EQ can be used. There aren't very many instances where I would want to use different EQ on the right versus the left channel of a stereo channel. However, if there are instances in a stereo channel where there's something happening that is a bit distracting, say, in one channel versus the other, or if things are a bit darker on one side versus the other, then we can use a stereo EQ that allows us to process the left and right channels independently to kind of level those things out as we see fit. Again, this is for stereo signals only. In many cases, we'll actually have two mono signals. For example, we have the two guitars right here, which are two mono signals. So we would use a mono EQ to better balance those, even though they are panned to the left and right. However, if we were given a single track, say a keyboard that was in stereo and it had balancing issues between the left and right, then we could opt for a stereo EQ to get those results within a single EQ. Additionally, we have dual mono EQs, which effectively give us the same thing where we can have an EQ, for example, if we choose the channel EQ dual mono, where we have independent control over the left versus the right, and we can do things that way. We can also couple them so that any changes made in one will be reflected in the other. Let's reset these and then say I boost this up to 10. We'll see that we have the same thing over here. And this coupling is essentially stereo linking in a stereo EQ. So I hope all of that makes sense. Clicking on these three dots with any of Logic's stereo plugins that allow for dual mono, we can also come in here and change it to mid-side processing if we so choose so that we have independent control over the mids now versus the sides. So if we decouple this, we can adjust the mids versus the sides. Another great part of using Logic, I really like this particular function within Logic. So you can use this if you are a Logic user or if you have a similar function in your DAW, I would highly suggest investigating this to just at least have that tool in your mixing toolbox. 
So this has been a super long video, the longest one yet, but I just really wanted to show you the different EQ types that we have available to us to really strengthen your toolbox and to get you thinking about EQ perhaps in different ways as you go through and mix with EQ in your mixes. All right, so there's a look at all the different EQ types we have available to us in music production and mixing. If you've made it this far into the video, I would like to thank you very much for spending your time here with me on YouTube. And if you would like to spend more time, I would highly recommend you hit that subscribe button button to the My New Microphone YouTube channel. I'm just getting started out. It's a one-man show and it really helps me out a lot here. As always, if you'd like to up your mixing and music production game, I do have a free mixing guidebook. It will be the first link in the description box down below. You can click that link, sign up to my newsletter, and I will send it to you right away. And in typical style, I will also leave a video in the top left and top right corner if you'd like to watch another video here on the My New Microphone YouTube channel. So click on one of these, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.